All right, we have a volume of a, I try to draw a cylindrical, no, rectangular pillar. So I'll just redraw that rectangular pillar a little bigger without all that stuff around it. <coughs> oh, it's really bad. All right, that's more of believable. We'll just pretend that the sides are straight. Good enough. It's supposed to be that little green one, but not written with everything else drawn on top of it. All right, this is gonna be, we need two in index values. I can't just call this uh, like volume J because I have to go X and Y axis. So I have two index values. So we'll call this V I J. So that'll be the volume in the i throw j -th column as we go across. So we're going to have to index with two of these. So our volume is approximately equal to summation i equals 0 to n summation j equals 0. We don't have to both go up to n. I could have like n subdivisions one way and then like two n subdivisions the other way so you don't have to go n and n but just to make things easier i'll just choose n for both of the subdivisions here and then we just have v i j so we're going to add up all the volumes for uh, i and j together how do we turn this approximation into the actual volume well eventually we will do integration but this in this form right here what can I do to the right side so that my next line is volume equals? And integration volume and derivative is not <coughs> an option here. Volume equals uh, summation of i variables and summation plus summation of the j variables. As n's approach infinity. There we go. So we need to make finer and finer subdivisions. So. It looks like I drew it maybe like we have five going one way, maybe about five going the other way. So this would be five by five grid. If I cut into smaller pieces, I get a better uh, estimation. So what I'm going to do is just cut it infinite number of pieces both directions. So we just go and write lim and approaches infinity of these summations. Yes, those are ends. Now, the way we got the heights, they were the function values. So we just took the, and that's what I did in purple right here. So we had some point right here. We'll call this x, i, j. That'll be the x, y value on the uh, bottom. And then the height, you're gonna take that, the way we define the surface, somewhere over here, we said f, Nope, I never wrote down the function. The service is from a function. So the surface height is z, it's a z coordinate, and it's going to be f of xy. not going to use x and y. I'm just going to call it x1, x2. Uh, we could actually keep it in x and y. I have an inconsistent notation. So we'll keep it x and y. All right, so that's our height right there. So our height over x i y j will be uh, f of x i y j. Now my comma looks just like a j. So this is my height right here. And 
and our base area, we'll do that in green. What is the base area going to be? How big will that base be that I just colored in? What do I need to multiply together? The length, and the width. length and the width. How in the world do we figure out the length and the width? The total length and the total width divided by n. There we go. So we'll just take the total. So we know the original measurement. We better start mucking these things off. So we have an original. measurement in these directions right here and if we use the same uh, as before our x went from we got to decide that's x that's y Is that, are those the usual assignments so just using in the upper left our x is going from a to b it's a little weird a is small so it's closer to the origin B is bigger, further from the origin, which in this case kind of means below and to the left. And we got C and D on the Y. So there's C, there's D. So we, we can measure the width and the other width. I don't really want to call it base and I width. But they're both kind of the same measurement, but obviously different numbers. So we just take those and divide them by N. So our base area I'll just call it length times height. Oh, base area. And then both of them are divided by N. So we got B minus A over N times D minus C over n, n squared. All right, so there's our base area. Now I can write down the volume pretty easily. Volume of the nth uh, column, rectangular column. It's not the nth rectangular column, it's the ijth. ijth rectangular column, vij equals, we got 1 over n squared. Uh, let's write the English version out. We'll do base length times. Why did I call that height? It should be width. Sorry, the time change really messed me up. <laughs> length width. Now the volume will be length times width times height, and that'll make everybody happy. All right, we have, uh, and the length times width is just base area. So our base area is right there. B minus A, C minus D over N squared. Our height is whatever the F function told us it would be. You just have to make sure you use X, I, Y, J for your uh, inputs to that function. So I'm going to rewrite this. Just reorder it, x, i, y, j. I'm going to put the uh, other two at the end. And I'm going to split them back up. So there are some familiar names for b minus a over n and c minus d over n. So I'm going to zoom back in here for a minute. So 
So another name for this measurement that I'm highlighting here would be delta x. That's how much x is going to change each time. And then the other measurement right here, so this width right here, will be delta y. So how much x changes in one, di one, dimension, or one direction, and then y, how much y changes in the other direction. So we got a delta x and a delta y for the base width and height. Okay, so that's Vij. Now we're going to take this back to our summation, which is in green here. should be over n. But shouldn't it be d minus c? Yes, it should be d minus c. Uh-oh. D minus c, and that probably showed up everywhere else. Let's see. Okay. So if you remember way back to calculus one, what did this turn into? An integral. So this turns into an integral. This has not just a dx integral, this is a dx dy integral. So this is gonna have two variables, your integral uh, double integral you're gonna be doing. So this is uh, <coughs> there's really two integrals, so we'll do one at a time. So the way it's written, the inner integral is basically here. So that's the inside integral. So what I'm going to do is put some square brackets in right there. So that's the inside integral right there. And that's f of x, y dx. And here when I write down my bounds, they're both x's, so I'm going to go from x equals a to x equals b. Now I'm going to do the similar thing for the y integral, so we're going to get a dy at the end, and now my endpoints are y equals c to y equals d, and here's our volume. And then we'll write a pretty version, we can put a box around, That's our volume right there. So we can write it down. Now the question is, can we actually compute with it? So I showed you with order of operations, what does a double integral mean? It means you have one integral and then another integral. Just like if you compute a double derivative like you did on the quiz or homework problems. You compute one derivative, and then when you're done with that derivative, you get the derivative of that derivative. Of course, you have to pay attention to what variables you're in and all that. Just like here, you're going to do an x antiderivative, you know, plug in the x endpoints, and then the result, you're going to do a y antiderivative, plug in the y endpoints. So it's basically two integrals in a row. Can you do a y derivative then an x derivative for integral? That's a very good question. The short, ans the short answer is usually yes, uh, as long as your region and function aren't too crazy. So in general, you can change the order. There are uh, conditions that you have to be careful about when you're not allowed to, and we'll look at those. So that's one way to compute the volume. Let's look at a completely different way, although somewhat similar. So what we're going to do is take a volume. We're going to subdivide it, but subdivide it in a very different way. So here we took basically looked at the base and chopped the base up into squares or rectangles. 
and then uh, looked at the height of these small little uh, bases. What if we just cut this up like uh, if it was a loaf of bread? So we're going to slice it. So we're going to subdivide it, but instead of cutting it into basically cutting it on two axes or in two dimensions, we're going to cut it in just one dimension. So we're going to have is slices of bread. And this is actually shaped kind of like the beginning of a loaf of bread. So it's a really good analogy for this particular shape right here. So we're just going to basically have a start of a loaf of bread right there. Should relate everything back to food. Most people I know eat food. <laughs> Not controversial. So we're going to look at volumes using cross sections. What people do you know that don't eat food? You said most. I can't tell you that. So let's try to draw the same region, and this time we're going to slice it parallel with the x-axis. So we'll start with those same three axes we had, and then we had our base here. Something like that. All right, we're going to cut parallel with the, no, I can't say parallel with an axis. That doesn't make any sense. You have to cut perpendicular to an axis. So we'll cut perpendicular to the y axis. Yeah, you, you could talk about being parallel to a plane. So lines and planes are. You can describe a line by a plane if they're orthogonal. But if a line is parallel with a the plane, there's lots of lines parallel with a plane, which is why you can't just say, it doesn't make sense to say a line's parallel with the plane. Or it's a property, but it's not unique. There's infinite numbers of lines parallel with planes. So that's not going to define one in terms of the other. But if they're orthogonal, then if you know one, you know the other. All right, slice perpendicular to the y axis. So we're basically going to go down the y axis as we, uh, changing y coordinates as we make slices. So we'll just connect it back to the y axis here and go from C to D. And we're just going to, I'll use green, we're going to make a bunch of slices here. Draw the first slice of bread. I don't really want to try to draw the top of this piece of bread, but I think you get the point. <laughs> it's good enough. No, actually, I do want to draw it. And then I think I just retrace that line back, and then I think to make this look reasonable, there should, in my mind, there should be some something else going on at the top aside from just those two curves. So now our cross sections actually have a volume. Let's think about ways to measure. We're going to have some width that I'm going to need. What's a good name for the width of the piece of bread? What's that? 
I could use W. What's a better calculus name for it? Delta Y. Delta y. There we go. So that's the exact same measurement we were taking before, but <laughs> we're not, we don't have a delta x now because we didn't cut. There was no cuts along the x-axis. So we need to get this area, or this volume is the surface area of one side of the slice of bread. So we get the surface area of one side of it. We'll multiply by the width, and that'll give us the volume of that piece of bread. So that's all we have to do. So I'll try to shade that in. I'm going to use a highlighter. So this should be the right side I'm shading in here. That's pretty convincing. So this is our surface area. call this, uh, well what coordinate does this depend on? We're going to get different surface areas on different slices, but what coordinate does the slice area depend on? X and Y? No, not both. X and Z. X. So when I change my Y coordinate, I get different slices. So it's going to, it's going to be a function uh -huh. of Y. It's going to change as the Y coordinate changes. So we'll write this as a uh, S of Y. So it's a function of Y. And now we can write the volume is approximately equal to summation I equals uh, 0 or 1, that doesn't matter, to N SYI delta Y. So this is the slice area, the surface area multiplied by the thickness of the slice. That gives me the volume of the bread, and you add up all those, we'll get an approximation. So the full volume, the regular volume, is a limit of all these. As n goes to infinity, and we know this turns into an integral from c to d. Y dy. All right, so any questions on this slightly different subdivision? Could I do the same thing on the along the y uh, x axis? Absolutely. So let's do it. We're going to skip all these steps. Slice perpendicular to x axis. What uh, now s would probably be a bad letter to use. We'll go with t. T of x will be the surface area. slice at x. So we get the volume is going to be the integral from a to b tx dx. So we got two different uh, ways to slice the bread up to get the same volume. <coughs> now we're going to look at all I did was write down the S of Y and T of X, we're going to look at where they come from. So before we do that, these are both the exact same thing, so that means integral A to B TX DX is integral A to C to D SY DY. So where did TX and SY come from?
So I just wrote them down. I didn't talk at all about where they came from. So let's go back to where we have a nice picture. How could you figure out, so this we had that S of Y is the area. How could you figure out the function for S of Y? How in the world do you get a two-dimensional area off a of function? By integrating. So this is a calculus one problem. So the way we get S of Y, we're gonna fix a Y coordinate. So let's say we got Y naught. I guess the bad, that implies it's the first one. We'll go with YI. So fix some YI. And now what we have is change your X coordinate, go from A to B. <coughs> go from A to B and do a regular calculus one integration and define the area. So you're going to fix yi. So it's going to be an integral from a to b. What function represents the height? z, which is the function f. Now we've got an issue. f takes two variables, takes an x and a y. But this integral is supposed to be a function of one variable. What y variable should I feed the function? Not just any y value. Y i. It's a constant in the integral here. So that's the s y function right there. Oops. Um, that should be a y i on the left. It doesn't matter what letter you use, I or J, or K. It's just a temporary value. I, was I using, yeah, I was using for J's for Y's before, but. <laughs> we are, it doesn't matter which way you slice it. That's the moral of today's lesson. Unless your loaf is really ugly, it actually can matter in certain situations, but not in a normal loaf, loaf of bread. Since we can slice along the x-axis or y-axis, can we slice it across the z-axis? Oh, for sure, you can slice across the z-axis. What is, so there's a fundamental difference. The way that this loaf of bread is shaped, what's the difference between going on the x, the way we cut it, the two ways we cut it are very different than if you sliced it in the, along the vertical axis. What would be the major difference? <laughs> we have no idea what any of these dimensions are. <laughs> Infinity there was some really important assumption that we made in order for all these things to work out. The base was a rectangle. So if we slice another direction, our base will be weird shaped. It will not be a rectangle. This particular example is pretty close to being a rectangle because I chose like very long vertical sides, but I could have chosen uh, a piece of bread that had very short vertical sides, like more like a muffin or something like that. <laughs> well, it's not, it's round. <laughs> I know, I'm not a baker. Cake, a rectangle, like a short rectangle cake. <laughs> I don't know, with a very rounded top. <laughs> donut. It's the, no, it's not like at all a donut. Cake. Like a sheet cake? Yeah, let's do a donut. <laughs> it's like this. Piece of cornbread? Corn yeah. Alright, am I speaking your language now? <laughs> 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 that rose up really high <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Very important information. Alright, so we're going to have service area going the other direction. So we're going to do the exact same thing. I talked about slicing it, but I just said, hey, there's this TX function, it comes from somewhere, obviously it can be constructed in a really similar way to our SY. So we're about to write down the TX function. Or you're about to write down the TX function. And I'll get you started. 
So that's as much of a hint as I want to give you. You got to fill in there's three, four blanks, two variables into the function, and then start and end values in your integral. So if you zoom out, does it sweep the x-axis to the bottom half? Well, you don't need that right now. Oh, yeah, okay. So this says we can cut along an axis, any of the three axes. I'm assuming that we can cut along a line, any line in space. Yeah. And if we can do that, can we cut across any function in space? Probably. Okay. But the price you pay for not going down an axis can be steep. Yeah. So there's something called a Jacobian that measures the, the volume of the unit not necessarily cube, because if you're in polar coordinates, you have unit, uh, we saw what they look like, unit pizza crusts, I called them. Uh, and then in three dimensions, you have the three dimensional pizza crust. So that's what you learn in calculus for, is how the volume changes when you change coordinates. Is there a circular coordinates when polar coordinates go to three dimensions? Yeah, but I want to talk about it right now. Okay. They're cylindrical and spherical coordinates. You can look them up. <coughs> All right, so we have A to B. That should have been super clear. What variables do I feed the function f? X, I, and y. So we're going to feed it the x, j, and then the regular y. So it's really a function of one variable which is really just a y, because x, j is fixed. It's not moving. Uh, I may have switched i's and j's, but that's not super important right now. OK, so we have a function for s of y. And oh, that's a good question. Which two should I use? So I'm going to change my highlighter to some gray. We'll see how that works. So I'll highlight the back. What coordinate do you change to take this and go across the entire volume? So if you think back to squeegeeing windows from calculus 2, if I squeegee along the y-axis, am I going to go through the entire volume? Nope. In fact, that cross-section I drew has x-coordinate of a. What I have to do is take my x coordinate and increase it all the way to b if I want to cover my entire volume. So this is the one dimension up analogy of squeegeeing a window. You're now kind of, I guess you could think of scanning a three dimensional object with by a two dimensional plane. <laughs> oh, that should be c to d. Nobody said anything. <laughs> That's definitely wrong. <laughs> All right, so I do all these things to make sure you're paying attention. You were just not paying attention quickly enough, I think. Oh, that's fine. That will be my first mistake that's been recorded, I'm sure. So this one come from. OK. So we saw where they come from. Let's write their versions in uh, the integrals right here, where you see tx and sy. I'm going to write those versions from above. It would have been really obvious here where the mistake was.
So what this equation tells us, you can change the order, assuming you start on a rectangular base. So if you know you're integrating over a rectangular base, you can change the order no problem. We're definitely going to go over non-rectangular bases, yeah. Uh, order is going to be changed when region is a rectangle. And the letter we're going to start using for region is an R, capital R, but it doesn't have the two vertical lines in it. It just has one. Uh, and this is when our region is AB cross CD. So we're going to use this notation a lot right here, where we cross an interval with another interval to get a rectangle. So I talked about this, I think, last class or two classes ago. This is a fast way to write out a rectangle. Alright, so none of you noticed that, uh, let's see, one of these variables should have been an xi or a yj, and the other one should have been yj or xi, but nobody said anything. I said it didn't matter which of the subscripts we picked, but why is it? Why do I not need a subscript anymore? So let's think about what's happening. So right here we have TX, and I'm going to look back at TX used FXJ. So I'm going to temporarily write the J here. I'm going to take it back out. <coughs> so if we think about what's happening on the inside right here, well, x is changing, but not in this part of the integral. In this part of the integral, what is changing? y. So the integral, just the way it's written, says x is not changing. If we zoom out a tiny bit, x is changing, and the minimum x value is a, the maximum is b. So when you actually do your integration here, because it's a dy, you are not treating x like a variable. You're treating x like a constant. So the calculus works out because x is a constant, treat it as a constant when you do this integration. Get this dot out of there. Come on. There we go. Uh, the same thing happens over here. If you examine the that right there, the y is constant. So in here the y is constant and uh, we don't have to do anything special to the y because it's just constant by uh, the way integral, the order of the integration keeps y constant. Alright, so this is called Fubini's first theorem. So dA is dx dy or dy dx. You can choose. So there's two ways to integrate this. They come down to which order do you want? dx dy or dy dx? So I'm going to write down both of them and then we'll just compute it one of the two ways. So one way to do it, we'll go dx dy first. So if I choose dx dy, what 
numbers go here? Is it 0, 2, or negative 1, positive 1? I agree it's 0, 2. Why do we choose? It's not really a choice. Why do we use 0, 2? Well, yeah, let's not worry about how. We'll compute it in a minute. But why did I choose 0, 2 for my inside and not negative 1, 1? Because these are x values, so our first integral is an x integral. Our second integral is a y integral. So I got x endpoints match the x integral. Now when I go outside, it's going to be y endpoints match the y integral. So we got y equals 1, y equals negative 1. Those are my y end values and beginning values. And we'll write on the exact same integral, but switching the order next to it. So take 20 seconds and write down the endpoints. Make sure the order is super important. So make sure it's, think about it as inside, outside. It's not really left and right, but it's the outsides have to match and the insides have to match. So it doesn't matter which one we integrate, it should give you the exact same thing. I believe that both of these should be equally easy slash difficult to do. Let's just go ahead and do the first one I wrote down, right here. When you go and do these, I recommend that you add in, especially when you're beginning, the explicit order of operations so that I'm just not focused at all on the y dy part. I don't want to be looking at those y values. I don't want to be looking at dy. I just want my x dx, x values and dx right there. So do this x antiderivative. It may be easier to bring your constants out front, which are negative 6y, and your actual variable term is x squared. So I just rewrote that part with the constants out front. It's a little weird why is a constant when you're doing an x antiderivative. Probably. So I haven't taught you how to do anti-partial antiderivatives yet, but I've shown you a lot how to guess and check, and we've done partial derivatives. So what partial derivative would I use to check if this is correct? D a ddx derivative. So if I take the next derivative, I definitely get 100. That's no problem. But I get a negative 9x squared y. So on my check is where this messes up. And I should indeed have a negative 2. There we go. Don't forget your endpoints. We're going from 0 to 2. Now we have to plug in those endpoints before we actually can go further. So we get 100 times 2 minus 2 times 2 cubed y minus 0 minus 0.
inches on that 400. This would be the... Technically, this is an area we just computed. Or it could be a volume. I didn't really write down what this represented. We'll see soon that you can compute areas or volumes. If you think about the height always being 1, you could think about the volume is the same as the area of the top side or the bottom side of that shape. But we'll see all that in a while.